Cougs house. All right, football's fun. It's been going all right. Are you ready for basketball season yet? You are locked on Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, a podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Ainsworth. And whether you're a Houston fan or just a hater that came to step by, thank you for making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Appreciate you making it your first listen each and every day. If you want to join the conversation, but I know what to say. Tell us in the comments down below, where do you start brushing your teeth? Do you go front, middle, back, right? Go across the face there. Tell us in the comments down below. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. More on that later. But we're getting ready for basketball in this episode of Locked On Cougs. Andy Patton of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Yes, there's a whole show just for college basketball nationally. Want to sit on top about previewing the Cougs. So we decided to sit down and preview the Cougs. Let's get into it. What's up, folks? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Andy Patton, and you're joining us at the place to get your college basketball content every single day, five days a week, 52 weeks out of the year in the middle of the offseason. We're still talking college basketball here. Folks, want to thank you all for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Remind you to join us on our Locked On College Basketball Discord channel if you have not done so yet. There's a link in the show notes. It is free to join. We're talking college hoops all the time. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Well, I am joined today by Parker Ainsworth, the host of the Locked On Cougs podcast. We're talking Houston Cougars basketball today, part of our team preview series. For those of you who have been listening to the show throughout the month, we have already done quite a few of these team previews. We talked Kentucky and Kansas. We talked Gonzaga, Alabama, Iowa State, Creighton, Baylor. And then recently we talked about the pair of powerhouse ACC programs, Duke and North Carolina. If you want to get caught up, there's a playlist on YouTube with every single one of the team preview episodes. We're also doing conference previews as well. We are right in the thick of preview season, and I'm very excited to be joined by my friend Parker to talk about this Houston club. Uh, and the big question last year, Parker, around this time was kind of what Houston would look like adjusting to the Big 12. Obviously, conference realignment has been a huge storyline for the last couple of years. It's back rearing its ugly head right now with the Pac-12 coming back into the into the mix and, and in fact, pursuing some teams from that American Athletic Conference. And uh, for if people are worried that teams like like Memphis or Tulane or whomever could might struggle to adjust, look no further than what Kelvin Sampson and Houston did last year because they jumped from the AAC to the Big 12 and they didn't even miss a beat. They went 15-3 and three in the strongest college basketball conference in the country last year. In the Big 12, they earned a number one seed. They did it for a second straight year. Their, their strength of schedule, according to sportsreference.com, basically doubled. Their schedule was twice as hard last year, and they still earned a one seed, still had a tremendous season. Uh, Parker, as somebody who covered the team last year, who was kind of covering them through that transition into the Big 12, were you surprised to see them have that level of success? Or did you, knowing just Samson and the way that he operates, did you kind of expect to see them continue to dominate the way that they have? I think academically i would say yes the fan in me was not now we win every game right but the act mm -hmm. like there was part of me that knew that there was gonna be a challenge and i i would stress that the you know you did a great job of summarizing the part you left out is they lost two guys in the first round of the nba draft the year mm -hmm. before right and that was two mm -hmm. starters uh marcus has been a multi-year starter all conference all american jared walker the one and done five-star freshman they lost both of them and then in the big 12 mm -hmm. and and then you know they won the regular season by two full games. They ran out of steam in the conference tournament, yeah. right? But um, on, on the whole, I'd say that's you know more successful than the analyst and me would have thought. Mm -hmm. um, Samson's got something going, man, and it, it seems to translate no matter who they're playing against, where they're playing, how they're playing. It, it's just the culture of the program. Yeah, and that's I mean that's kind of what I wanted to talk about too. Is like I think for for Samson, this this is just par for the course. I mean, this is a man who's he's made twenty appearances in the NCAA tournament in his career. Uh, a couple of them got, got wiped out by some uh, 
allegations that at this point wouldn't even be illegal in college athletics a long time ago when he was at Wazoo. But like this is somebody who just wherever he's been, where, whether he's coaching in this conference, this team, this program, this side of the country, it doesn't matter that his teams are hard nosed, they're tough, they're physical and they don't back down from a challenge. And, and I think, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, of course, they were going to come in and, and have that success. And they kind of established it right away, picked up some big wins. You and I were talking before we hit the record button, like Houston didn't get a favorable schedule in year one. No. either. Like I thought no. they had to play some really tough games, some tough road games and didn't even seem to phase them at all. They, like you said, they replaced two starters, uh, two lottery picks. They, you know, they go out and get a, a huge big time addition in LJ Cryer. Uh, Jamal Shedd steps up into a massive role for this team, but they just kind of steamrolled their way into the conference. And yeah, Kansas was down and had some injury stuff towards the end of the year. Uh, but this is, you know, this was still a really deep, really strong conference and and it just didn't even seem to bother them whatsoever. Now, we did, we did run into some problems when we get in the NCAA tournament and two years in a row, unfortunately for Houston, we've seen injuries kind of rear their ugly head at really inopportune times. Last year, we had the Jamal Shedd injury, which, uh, you know, helped lead to that loss to Duke the year before that. I know Marcus Sasser had dealt with some injury stuff kind of coming into that tournament as well. And so you're looking at a team that has earned a one seed in back-to-back -back years, but hasn't advanced as far as, as the expectations were for those last couple of years. Now they went to the final four in 2021. They went to the elite eight in 2022. So it's not like the tournament success hasn't been there recently, uh, but I'm starting like, what is, has the success that this team has had, kind of elevated the expectation for this program of, hey, we're, you know, Sweet 16 is not good enough anymore. Like we need to be in the Elite Eight. We need to be in the Final Four. And we'll talk more about this specific roster later in the show, but it almost feels like Samson's success has now like elevated how the fan base expects him to perform and puts even more pressure on this team. Yeah, I think that's a, a well put point. The truth is, is that um, there was kind of a starving feeling for good basketball. Mm -hmm. you, you had... Five Slam Majama in the 80s. I don't mean yeah. to say the history wasn't there. You had some good teams even in the early 90s that I think people kind of forget about. Mm -hmm. But then there was just this long, when the Southwest Conference fell apart, yeah. Houston kind of fell out of the money game. The CUSA days were kind of lost in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was part of it, those first several years, you mentioned they made five Sweet 16s in a row at this point. Like They were just happy to be in the dance, let alone in the Sweet 16, right? And I think you're kind of alluding to it. it's like okay like you know let's get back that final four thing was nice let's get back to that right um 2023 was a big you know let down emotionally i think because the final four was in houston um and so the thought of like if you can get to the final four then you're playing basically it's not your home floor but you're playing at home right uh and what that could have done obviously marcus sasser's groin injury he played through it but he was not himself yeah right um last season you got a pretty favorable draw i would argue in the in the actual bracket itself um and jamal shed turns an ankle in the duke game he loses that game by a whopping three points even though he didn't have it for most of it yeah right i i, I think that it feels like a couple strokes of bad luck and i, I do think people understand that but also like at some point you got to worry about depth and, and we'll get mm -hmm. to this year's team in a second but like 2023 they basically played like six and a half guys yeah 2024 was a little bit better but they had injuries tallied up jojo tugler went down so by the time they got to the tournament it was also not very deep i think they've they've looked at this roster for this year as a little bit better than that i think it's also raised expectations like you're saying that's a perfect transition into this because as we talked about like they went into the Big 12 having to replace two players who were selected in the NBA draft. This year, yeah, they lost Jamal Shedd, and we're going to talk about that because that's a massive loss. But Houston returned the other four starters from last year's team. They also got a potential breakout candidate back from an injury in Terrence Arsenal. We're going to talk about that and how Samson's going to put all these pieces together because I agree. I think this team might be even deeper and potentially more talented than last year's team. So we're going to talk about how those pieces might all come together for this Houston team. Coming up in just a second. But first, folks, let's talk about FanDuel because you've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Usually this summer, we've been filling you in on how to get a boost or a bonus offer from FanDuel. However, we have something a little bit different for you today. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. 
So you got $5 Houston currently plus 1600 odds to take home the national championship in 2025. So you get 80 bucks directly in your pocket if that happens. So you just got to throw $5 down. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on now to download America's number one sports book. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is also brought to you by Game Time. Folks, going to live events, it's the absolute best. Whether it's music, sports, theater, comedy, and now we got college football back, college basketball following suit in just over a month. I am looking forward to making so many new memories this college sports season. And great news, when you're getting tickets for this year, Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste your time searching through thousands of different tickets. Whether it's Game Time's ticketing coverage, the lowest price guarantee, or the panoramic views from your seat in the app, Game Time has got you covered. And we know Houston and Auburn have a big matchup November 9th at the Toyota Center in Houston. Right now, Game Time has two tickets on the baseline in Section 125 for just $37 a piece. So, folks, right now you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. You can get those two tickets for $54 if you go to Game Time right now, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for $20 off. Terms do apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, Parker, continuing our conversation here, previewing the Houston Cougars coming off of an outstanding season last year, their first as a member of the Big 12. And as we talked about in that first segment there, this is a team that returned a ton of talent. Uh, it's a team that didn't have a, a ton of offseason moves. And, and you kind of expect that with the Kelvin Sampson team. We've seen a lot of like some of those veteran programs out there that aren't doing a lot of, of roster movement year over year. Certainly the, the Big 12 has had quite a few teams that have turned over their rosters in big ways. Kansas made a lot of moves. Baylor brought in some big-time players. But Iowa State is another team similar to Houston that kind of kept the majority of, of the group together. And I, I'm very interested – looking ahead to next year, how those teams that that have more continuity are going to do. Because for for Houston here, again, Jamal Shedd's gone, but LJ Cryer's back. Emmanuel Sharp is back. Juwan Francis is back. Uh, Javier Francis is back. Is that how you say it? Javier Javier Francis? Uh, Samson himself says it, Javier. Javier. (laughs) We're going to trust Samson on that, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) For better or worse, I guess. For better or worse, right. The team also returns Terrence Arsenault, uh, and and he's a guy who averaged about five and a half points, four and a half boards per game last year. That was only in 11 games before coming down with the injury. He had a really promising freshman year, and I think he's a guy that, depending on how ready he is to contribute in a, in a major way for this team, I think is a, a fairly big X factor for where this Houston team's kind of ceiling ends up kind of kind of lying because he, there's not a lot of newcomers on this team. And Arsenault's not a newcomer per se, but a guy who I think could kind of raise the ceiling in a significant way. You also get back Malik Wilson, veteran guard. You get back Joe Tugler in the front court. You got some other guys coming back as well. Um, and, and Parker, we can talk about the returners, but I also want to emphasize the departures here because uh, Ryan Elvin was was kind of a bit player, not a, a huge loss necessarily. Damian Dunn was a pretty good player. He transfers to Pitt. Uh, he's going to be a, a contributor for that Panthers team in the ACC. But obviously the big loss is Jamal Shedd, a guy who ended up getting selected in the second round of the NBA draft. I was so happy to see him get that recognition and was going to be fairly frustrated if he didn't because uh, he was clearly good enough to be an NBA player and, and a guy who – uh, you don't just lose his production on the court. It feels like there's more that that kind of goes into losing a player like Jamal Shedd, especially for a coach like Samson, who who values that kind of tenacity and veteran leadership and workhorse mentality that, that Shedd really seemed to encapsulate kind of perfectly throughout his career in Houston. Yeah, and it's funny, right. rattling off those names, I'm realizing we also, in the first segment, forgot that they lost Ramon Mark, the transfer portal, because I was yeah, t- I was thinking right. in my head about like how remarkable it is that none of those guys ended up leaving. Um, the The truth is, is that you don't lose three starters off of a team like that mm-hmm. that was number one in the country for a period of time mm-hmm. and get back to that place without a guy like Jamal Shedd, right? Yeah. They just, they just he, he's got to be there to kind of keep it all even and steady. Mm-hmm. He was an All-American. He was Conference Player of the Year, Conference Defense Player of the Year, et cetera, in the Big 12. You mentioned second-round pick to uh, Toronto. Masai Ujiri is pretty good at that, so I think he knows mm-hmm. what he's doing there. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing, though, is after he got hurt, um, 
he got hurt in the Sweet 16 game, uh, like I said, in the first few minutes. So it was like seventh mm-hmm. minute or something like that of the game. And afterwards, Sanson, they were talking to him. Some reporter asked something. And a very honest question about, like, could some, could LJ Cryer have played point guard or just mm-hmm. something generic, right? And Sanson was just like, you can't just re- – place him right. like, like 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 it's not this is not like we just put in our backup point guard and it's a little mm-hmm. bit less productive it's like there's more to it than than that yeah. he gets a big put back duncan's a m the second round game at, at, at a glorified 511 let's be honest right like mm-hmm. he, he's he's covering their best guy running our offense if we need him to get 30 he gets 30 if we need him to get 12 assists he gets 12 assists right like he, he does all the things and mm-hmm. um it is only one guy in the starting lineup and mm-hmm. only, you know, Damian Dunn played a lot in some games, not a lot in others, mm-hmm. but one guy out of the major rotation across all 38 uh, games. Mm-hmm. But it's, it is a lot more than one guy in a lot of other ways. Like you said, he's, he's a big part of the culture. And if we're being honest, I bet his numbers hanging in for Tita center very soon. Yeah. I think it should be with, without a doubt. And and you look at this team, they, they lose shed and Dunn and Elvin, like we said, but they got some, some exciting guys coming in. The, the main name, uh, the most notable guy in terms of, I think, playing time in year one, who's a new newcomer, is going to be Milo uh, Uzon here, coming over from Oklahoma, transfer, average about nine points, four and a half assists per game last year, good defender, really kind of a, a prototypical Kelvin Sampson type guard. I mean, it, it you just well, you watch the tape on him, you watch the Oklahoma games, you're like, okay, yeah, that guy's going to fit uh, in Houston's system quite nicely. And, and I think he's expected to be a big time contributor for this team right away. And then you get the two freshmen who are coming in, Mercy Miller, four-star guard, uh, 55th rank, ranked player in the class at 247 Sports. I actually saw quite a bit of Mercy Miller in high school because he was teammates with Dusty Stromer, who ended up going to Gonzaga. <laughs> uh, and since I was covering Gonzaga, that's a, a, a kid I've seen a lot of, and he's I think he's going to be a great fit for Kelvin Sampson and the Cougs as well. Yeah. And then they also get Chase McCarty, a top 100 prospect uh, in the class, four-star small forward. Uh, and, and so you're looking at these three newcomers, and, and I think j- based on Samson's history, you don't typically see freshmen freshmen play a ton of minutes. And considering how many guys are returning at the kind of two three spots for this Houston team, uh, I'm I wouldn't project that the two freshmen play a ton of minutes for this team right away. But there's a lot of upside with those two guys, and then you get a guy in who's on who's, who's going to play a big role, uh, if not starting at least a very big role for this team right away. So uh, maybe not a, a ton of players coming in, maybe not as flashy as players as you get at like, you know, Baylor's bringing in Norchad O'Meara and Jeremy Roach, but uh, Houston's adding the kind of guys that fit Kelvin Sampson's system. And at the end of the day, um, I'm not questioning that that system's working because clearly it is for Houston. Well, and like we mentioned, they brought back four of the five starters Mm -hmm. and at a lot of the bench as well. So I, I don't mean to sound cocky or presumptuous, but Mm -hmm. they were pretty darn good a year ago. And and they're bringing most of that roster. I think that's, why Mm -hmm. you don't need to go get a whole lot right and um i think that's kind of the sentiment from the fan base Mm -hmm. i do think milos is going to be an important ad Mm -hmm. um i think when they got crier a year ago they were hoping he'd kind of grow into more of a point guard Mm -hmm. they've relied on him a lot more of the two guard so Mm -hmm. uzan's he's going to do a lot of the running of the offense and stuff like that he had a couple different roles at oklahoma based on a couple different like teams he was with Mm -hmm. there um, I think the biggest thing, like I said, he fits the culture because he's a big, long, mm-hmm. and then scrappy as all get out guard, right? Yeah. Like he can get dirty with anybody. Yeah. And I think that's that's kind of the, the question here because, like you said, four, four or five starters are coming back. LJ Cryer is going to start. Sharp's going to start. Roberts, Francis, those guys are going to start. Uh, your fifth spot probably is going to Uzan. I think there's maybe – Maybe Terrence Arsenal completely pops off and he gets that spot. But I think the the consensus is going to be Uzon because you need a, a point guard. And, and LJ Cryer is pretty familiar with kind of playing off the ball. That's what he did last year. That's what he did at Baylor. And so it strikes me as like you you if you want to keep Cryer in the role that he's best at, that he's excelled at, that you would have Milos kind of step into that that starting point guard role. Again, he averaged four and a half assists per game for an Oklahoma team last year that was pretty good, uh, at least in the first half of the year. That kind of faded down the stretch. But uh, to me, that that kind of stands out as as the most likely outcome here. As if, I mean, again, you're not replacing Jamal Shedd. Uh, it, it, we'll use the, the money ball term. you got to replace him in the aggregate. You can't just replace him with one <laughs> no, guy. Completely. Um, but I think the, the starting spot that LJ Cry or that, excuse me, that Shed vacated is going to go to the Oklahoma transfer who's on here. Um, and I think he's going to fit nicely uh, and with some extra depth uh, coming off the bench, especially with Arsenal healthy. It feels like that is enough to be able to kind of keep this team afloat 
um, despite losing a, a really valuable uh, piece to this program in Shed. And, well, and bringing back Arsenal, uh, he is he has made 100% recovery, so I don't mean mm-hmm. this in a way that says he hasn't, and I hope mm-hmm. no one takes that way, but he did tear his Achilles last year in December, yeah. right? Like, it, it is a fairly significant injury, yeah. and so, you know, throwing him out there for 32 minutes a night might not be the best in anyone's interest yeah. anyway, right? So mm-hmm. bringing him off the bench as a rotational wing, Mm-hmm. He he was he and uh, Emmanuel Sharp were actually both the two guards they bring off the bench mm-hmm. in their freshman year. Then last year looked like that Arsenal was going to kind of be the sixth man before he went down, uh, and, and so I think that that's kind of his comfortable role. And so in bringing him back healthy, let's bring him back comfortably as well. Mm-hmm. I think that fits really well as the first guard off the bench this year. Yeah, and I think that's I mean the fact that Arsenal and Sharp were it kind of felt like they were on a similar trajectory. And you look at how Sharp finished the year. I mean, if you think Arsenal can be even 85 percent that kind of caliber player like that's a tremendous addition to the to the second unit to the rotation here for this team and i think you know looking at the rest of it malik wilson's going to be a rotation guy like he's been uh tugler is going to be that kind of third rotational big uh you got a couple other guys maybe the freshmen play kind of bit roles maybe they redshirt i know that's something that we've seen kelvin sampson do in the past but Uh, My last question to you before we move on to talk a little bit about Houston's schedule and some projections for how we think they're going to do this year is is who we kind of think this team's X factor is. And we've talked a lot about Arsenal, and maybe that is the guy that we go with. We've obviously talked a lot about Cryer, and I don't know. He's kind of more like the star player. I don't know if he's the X factor necessarily, but um, it feels like there's some guys who who really raise the ceiling of this team if they can kind of pop and play at a level that that, – maybe higher than they did last year or somebody who can kind of really raise the ceiling of this program. Is there anybody who just kind of stands out to you in that, that area? Uh, so I got, I got a couple of answers off the top of my head. My first thing I think uh, statistically is going to be Emmanuel. Emmanuel is yeah. Yeah. Uh, Emmanuel Sharp is, is going to be a junior this year. And I guess he's technically a red shirt. He, he tore up his leg, major injury, senior high school mm-hmm. and actually transfer. He actually uh, graduated early and came in mid year and took it as a red shirt freshman year, the second half of his year. Uh, would would have been a senior high school instead of going to prom he came to work out with coach allen bishop <laughs> he's gotten in a lot better shape each year he's had a, you mentioned tremendous growth um mm-hmm. there were games last year where they fell on jamal shed to just kind of go get a bucket because they needed yeah. something and i i think cryer like he mentioned is an off ball score he's really good at movement without the ball but that's not really what they're looking for in those moments sharp is a guy that's broad shoulders strong mm-hmm. attacks 6'3", 210, I don't mean to you know, be a homer, but if he were 6'5", this guy, we've been talking about NBA first yeah. round, like yeah. like he's that kind of a scorer. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that he'll be the guy you see feeling a lot of those kind of roles. Yeah. Um, Joan Roberts is the culture guy. He's been around there forever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so he'll be, I think, a leader in the locker room and off the, off the court kind of stuff. But Sharp, Sharp's the guy to keep an eye on if you're looking for point spreads and that kind of stuff. Well, Houston won the Big 12 in year one, like we talked about. Uh, this year, though, while we they got four starters back, we got a lot of excitement about this Houston team. We also saw a Kansas team completely reload in the transfer portal. We saw Baylor make some huge additions. Uh, we talked about Iowa State retaining most of their talent. And now Arizona is in the mix as a, a potential challenger for a top spot in the Big 12. So we're going to talk about it might be a tougher path for Kelvin Sampson and the Cougs to repeat what they did last year, but can they do it again? And if so, what does that mean for their potential to bring home a championship or at least bring back a final four appearance in 2025, excuse me. We're going to get to that in just a second. First folks, let's talk about today's new sponsor, Roy. Hey, college basketball fans. Have you heard about Roy? It stands for return on you. And it's a new platform that lets you, the fans, Get involved in NIL like never before by making contributions directly to your favorite athletes. By supporting players directly, you can help shape rosters, retain talent, and keep your favorite athletes out of the transfer portal. NIL has changed the game for athletes. Roy changes the NIL game for fans. Why use Roy? You get exclusive content access. When fans contribute to a successful campaign, they receive access to exclusive content from the athletes, such as their announcement decision, behind the scenes footage, and other personal reflections. So download Roy for iOS or Android and enter referral code locked on, and you'll automatically be entered into a sweepstakes to win $5,000 cash. Visit joinroy.com for additional details. No purchase necessary, void where prohibited. Get the Roy app for iOS or Android and start making an impact on your favorite team. 
Use that referral code locked on for an opportunity to win 5,000 cash. Visit joinroy.com for more details. All right, Parker, closing out the show and our Houston season preview here as we're about seven weeks away from the start of the college basketball season. I want to talk a little bit scheduling for Houston right now, talk about their non-conference schedule, talk a little bit about how we think they're going to do in what I expect to still be one of, if not the very best conference in college basketball this upcoming season in the Big 12, and talk about whether this team is going to get themselves back on that one seed line for a third straight year and how they might do in the big dance. Let's start with that non-conference schedule. We got an exhibition game against Texas A&M on the 27th of October. Always fun to see those exhibition games against marquee <laughs> opponents. Uh, and then the home slate for Houston in this non-conference, you got Jackson State, Louisiana, Hofstra, Butler, Troy, Toledo, and Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And then in the neutral site games, you have Auburn. We talked about that game a little bit earlier. Auburn in Houston at the Toyota Center. Uh, Isaac and I have talked a lot about on this show about how excited we are to see more marquee games coming to the first week of the college basketball season. It's something that doesn't happen all that often. And we saw this game. Gonzaga and Baylor are working on a game. I think Baylor and Arkansas are playing in the first week, too. We got some some actual good basketball coming in the first week of the season. And Auburn and Houston is going to be a great one. And then we, of course, have the new Players Era NIL Festival, uh, which there's been a little bit of controversy about that. But it sounds like it's going. It's it's happening. It's going forward. We have the map. For that, Houston's going to play Alabama. That's going to be a tremendous game. They also play Notre Dame and Rutgers. Those games will be in Las Vegas over Feast Week. I think they're the 26th, 27th, and then the 30th. I know there was like a weird gap mm-hmm. uh, in the games for that event. Um, Got to have time for turkey. Time for turkey. Yeah, yeah exactly. Giving everybody, folks, time, time, to, time to digest for a few days before <laughs> going back to that final game. But, Parker, one of the things that stood out to me, and this is not uncommon uh, for any team, uh, especially a team of Houston's level, but there's no true road games in the non-conference slate. So the first true road game that Houston will play in this upcoming season will be in the in conference play in the Big 12. And, and I am a proponent of thinking that, that playing true road games helps teams. Uh, and, and I think the more you can do that, the better. But I also know, like, as somebody who follows Gonzaga, like, you have, it takes two to tango. Like you may want to schedule a home game or a home and home series where you're going to go on the road. But if somebody doesn't want to schedule that with you, it's a little bit more challenging. To, is it concern you that Houston doesn't have any true road games or you think it's something that, you know, it's going to iron itself out in conference play anyway? Well, and th- this is totally me being a homer on this part, but I would also say that it would take a special person to invite Houston to come play them, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. like to go play at someone's place. Yeah. Um, I think you're asking for a lot there. Houston's yeah. very rough and physical. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that, you know, that's just camp Kelvin Sampson style of basketball. Yeah. As far as like, do I wish that from a, like getting to know this team, knowing what we've got, knowing mm-hmm. how we behave and how we act and those kind of things in those environments without Jamal shed. Absolutely. I wish we saw some sort of a test like that. Yeah. Auburn being a at Toyota center game, I think will mm-hmm. be interesting because Toyota center is big relative yeah. to Fertitta and it also is in conjunction with another game I believe it's Rice and somebody Rice from Florida State yeah and so there will be other fans in the stadium so yeah. it might feel more neutralish yeah. like frankly Rice fans will probably <laughs> boo, boo Houston in some regards right yeah. um and, and so that'll be interesting yeah um i as far as the level of competition goes i don't know you know obviously there's some people that play a lot more of the marquee matchups uh, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's like a handful of teams that play another two or three of those. But outside mm-hmm. of that, I'd say that really Houston's doing all right. And from a, yeah. a talent, they see perspective. Um, they see Auburn, they see Alabama. So it's two SEC, mm-hmm. Notre Dame, and Rutgers, other power conferences, mm-hmm. uh, Butler and the big East challenge. They luck mm-hmm. this year. That's coming to Houston. So mm-hmm. I, I think that um, on, on the whole, right. There are things to complain about, but I do think they will be mm-hmm. fairly well tested uh, even, you know, we haven't seen the Big 12 schedule come out. I guess you could mm-hmm. end up in Fog Island to start. And that would be pretty rough for anybody, yeah. uh, but that would be rough. You could play all road games, and that would still be rough to start mm-hmm. the season, right? Yeah, I, I don't dislike this guy. I've seen a lot worse <laughs> schedules, even like the the buy games that they have. Like Hofstra's had success recently. Troy and Toledo are, are, are not bad programs. Like I think this is a decent 
non-conference schedule for Houston here. And I, I think um, I personally would like to see more road games for for most teams uh, in the non-conference slates, but they're, they're just they're, there's not a lot of incentive to do it right now. So a lot of teams are just not choosing to, to do that. And certainly if you're any big Big 12 team, and it's certainly Houston among them, you just don't have to worry about it because you know you're going to get a ton of marquee games in conference play. And that's kind of how I want to close out the show. This team went 15-3 and three in the league last year. And, and without knowing all the specific matchups and everything, it's obviously hard to project. But this is a team that has a lot of continuity, that has had just tremendous amounts of success under Coach Samson. And, and while I think Kansas is better, I think Baylor is probably better. I think Iowa State's the same, maybe a little bit better. Uh, and then you add Arizona, and like that alone is a, a – tremendous tremendous top five in this conference and the fact that I'm feeling like a Kansas State roster that I truly love that I think is really good is pretty clearly sixth at best in this conference is is a testament to the depth and and talent in this league and I think it's going to be an absolute grind night in and night out but um, the question for you Parker is fairly simple And, and again without all the information that we have 15-3 15-3 and three last year, do you think that this is a team that's capable of, of replicating that and being in that same position or, or around that uh, heading into this upcoming season? I think the unfortunate thing for a fan is going to be they could be as good or better and not be 15-3, and three, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I think the truth is, is that um, it's a tough conference. You add some good teams. Mm-hmm. I bet the conference – I know they, they're up to 16 teams now. I bet the conference has – nine teams in the tournament this year um it's that kind of a deep conference and truthfully you could be better come march but worse Mm -hmm. in your record for january and february um you know last year they beat baylor in overtime well Mm -hmm. there's nothing to say that they played baylor a second time that one of those maybe i mean another one in baylor and it was a great game to be at frankly but i i don't um i don't know they win that game 10 out of 10 times right Mm -hmm. uh they lost at ames iowa well it's hard to play in ames how many times you got to go to ames again right like um Mm -hmm. they lost at tcu they won in in uh houston Mm -hmm. but if you only have to go at TCU, that you know that, that's how the matrix works out. Right. If you have to go to Arizona, right? Okay, mm-hmm. that that's tough all of a sudden. Like those mm-hmm. those things add up. And I do think Kansas is better. I do think Baylor is better. I, yeah. you know, I also saw Houston beat those programs a year ago. Yeah. I think the, the deal will be they could realistically be better, but their record be thirteen and five. And it's yeah. oh, the sky is falling. We lost two more games, and really they just they they played the same big 12 schedule and, and they lost one or two of those close games. Right. And that's, they won a lot of close ones last year. Parker Ainsworth. Thank you so much for coming on the show, folks. If you're listening to the show and you want to learn more about Houston, you want to get prepared to, to follow this team this year, definitely check out locked on Cougs. Fantastic show. Parker does great work covering the football and the basketball side of things for that Houston program. Uh, thanks again for hopping on and looking forward to talking to you more throughout the season. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Andy. It's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. We're going to be back on Thursday with another team preview show. And then Isaac and I are going to be back on Friday getting you ready with a conference preview as well. It's preview week, preview month here on Locked On College Basketball as we're still about a month plus, six or seven weeks out from the start of the college basketball season. Folks, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, peace out.